I have a lot to cover, and um, at some points I'll, I'll try to be frank. Um, I thought it was an excellent pre presentation by Peter Marx. Um, call me uh, maybe a, a booster skeptic. Right now, I'm, I'm on the fence of whether I'm going to get the, the booster or not. I noticed that the uh, CDC director, Rachel Walensky, got her booster a month ago with great fanfare, and she came down with COVID. I was boosted in uh, January with uh, uh, with the Omicron booster and still got it in, in April. So I believe in all that. I've got my flu vaccine. I got my test vaccine. I got my, you know, everything else. I'm just a little less than that. And then, um, as you'll see right now, is the number of cases around the globe are down. So, but uh, Mr. Marsh seemed to indicate uh, that uh, something's looming on the horizon. Uh, I asked my European guys to check out uh, France and Belgium to see what anything's going on there. I know the hospitalizations are not up there. So your guess is as good as mine as we're going to see it. But, you know, we're going to start off with a COVID recap. And here's the U.S. And you look at cases, hospitalizations, deaths. And really the case number is a, mis is, is a misleading number now because people self-test. You know, before it was, it was a PCR test reported it was to government authority. Now there's a, now there's self self testing. So more reliable numbers are hospitalizations and COVID deaths, and you see those numbers are substantially down, and they're almost down to levels we see we haven't seen uh, since COVID started. We know that there's been a lot of vaccinations, retail vaccinations. Uh, some question is whether they'll still have that authority next year or not. Or I, I hope they do. Um, but uh, they did certainly rise to the occasion. Now, this is the uh, seven day moving end of global COVID deaths. And look at that number now and the number in comparison to where we were before. So that's a positive number. And I'm not, I haven't heard any murmurs of around the world that anything brewing right now. Now, that doesn't mean something's not going to happen because we thought. We're out of the woods at the Delta than Omnicron. But right now, nothing seems to be you know, brewing on that on that front. And of course, in the United States, you know, call me a little bit of a skeptic is that you know, I'd like to know did of those million people that died, 750,000 of them over 65, did they die of it or did they die with it? And it's hard to tell because hospitals made more money if somebody died of COVID than they died not dying of COVID. So you know, trying to you know look at all the data and try to figure out what the most important thing is. In the retail pharmacy market last year, six out of every 10 per 100 prescriptions was a COVID vaccine. And this year, this, this number is about 2.3%. But the thing that we're really watching for is this cough, cold, and flu. And during COVID, when people were masked up out of school, there was not a cough, cold, and flu season. And uh, it looks as though that the 2022 might be a big flu season. Uh, if you rely on what's happened in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere, they had a big flu season. I'll show you a chart on that in a minute. And I can tell you that the uh, we see the flu symptoms up 400% from over last year right now, and pediatrics up 583%. And then, of course, the RSV, the respiratory virus, is breaking out to particularly in Virginia. A lot of uh, kids uh, in, in the Detroit area in, in uh, with cough, cold, and flu. This is the Australian flu season. The red line there is the this last flu season. You know, there there's basically peaks in uh, April, May, and June. Ours is six months six months after that, and they had a, a bigger flu season than they've had in the past. And some of the previous flu seasons were almost flatlined. They really wasn't much of them. So they did have a big one, and that is. If there's a concern I have, it's more fluid at this very moment than is COVID. And RSV at this very moment than it is than it is COVID. Now, um, this is the, the cough full of flu prescription. She's that red line. They're starting to run above where they were last year. And we'll see if that does continue. But I, as I told the uh, generic audience earlier this week, who makes a lot of these, these meds, is get me prepared because you might have a big, uh, a big influx of uh, of prescriptions for cough, cold, and flu. Now, market utilization is that 
we put together a healthcare index and we looked at COVID, pre-COVID was 100. We looked at December 2021 and then it was indexed at 99. What came back was office visits, institutional visits, and you overlay that with telehealth. What came back uh, though, it was se severely down in 2020 with screenings, diagnostic visits and the like. They did, they did come back, but we did have a loss here of, of those. Elective procedures didn't come back. The index at 99, 95, new prescription index at 95. That was through December. They have now subsequently come back. So the big concern of this healthcare index is elective procedures, and there may be a relationship with, with elective procedures and uh, inflation. This is what that all this healthcare index looked like. It just kind of trip down memory lane is that you start off at 100. And then you get to the second quarter of 2020, and you know it really kind of hit us in March of uh, March, middle of March of 2020, and it, the most intense part was March, April, May, and in into June. And you see that every everything was down uh, during those periods of time. Hard to get into a hospital, uh, hard to get to go see a doctor, uh, hard to get a new prescription. Much easier to get a refill prescription. So if you already had the prescription. You know they could make it a 90 day prescription and then you could you could move on but getting a new prescription was extremely hard to, hard to do uh so there's been a there's been a comeback on that with the exception of elective procedures now in 2020 just to show you how disruptive covid was there was almost a billion fewer diagnosis visits in 2020 than what was expected just think of that number a billion fewer uh, visits to healthcare practitioners during that period of time, 20% less, more or less. And depending on what specialty you're in, is there was big differences in endocrinology, and rheumatology, and primary care practitioners, and oncology from what uh, you would uh, what we normally expect. And my biggest concern would be in oncology that people weren't getting their pap smears, they weren't getting their mammograms, they weren't getting their PSA tests. Did that just put off the later? You know the, some of the, the problems that we're going to have on that. Now we have recovered since that, but you know we do have to remember that we lost this, you know a billion uh, a billion diagnosis visits, and during during this period of time we lost a million people. And then so the question comes up is what's the new normal? You know the new normal you're missing seven hundred fifty thousand people over sixty five, and we know they're the ones that have the most prescriptions. And we're trying to look at what what particular classes are affected the most on that. Uh, telehealth did rise to the occasion. And at one time during the lockdowns, it was 15% of all the health medical claims, 15%. Didn't exist before, 15%. Now it's about, about 8%. 8 and it's seeking its kind of what I call new levels. Not going to go away. It's part of healthcare going, going forward. Disadvantage telehealth has. If they don't have the vitals, the labs, and the diagnostics that make a doctor feel comfortable prescribing a new prescription. So that's that's a big disadvantage. Although I give you a caveat on that, you may have been reading about ADHD prescriptions just exploded. And a lot of them have been exploding from telehealth uh, uh, ventures. You might have seen that the CVS and Walmart had stopped doing business with cerebral, and, uh, and I think it's Dune that specialized in this. Because they were uncomfortable with the rigor that was, was being used to give these kids ADHD. So that being a concern. And um, you see that um, where uh, telehealth is still uh, still growing is in ADHD and asthma. The rest of it versus a year ago down. And you see particularly uh, uh, diagnosis business in the offices you know, uh, up uh, ADHD, up in asthma, up in uh, uh, autoimmune, and uh, and so forth. And then uh, this is the office, institutional versus offices. I just say this is that the, uh, the the institutions always went up and down depending on whether the governor of New York was locking down the hospitals or not, or the government the governor of this state was locking down a hospital, or the governor of that state was locking down. Because what they wanted to do is they wanted to protect, protect the hospital ICUs uh, for the COVID patients. And uh, still a bit kind of a bumpy ride. What's recovered much more 
is the office visits than the institutional visits. And partly probably why you see that elective procedures uh, stuff, which is uh, on this, which is, um, it did recover for a while. Now it's been sliding off for the last three months. And so I, you know, an elective procedure could mean three different prescriptions. You know, if it's a dental procedure, any swelling, antibiotic, pain. So that's one thing we're watching. For. Oh, sorry. Now, where are we now? So those declines in that last slide, that was hospital-based declines? No, that's just elective, that's elective procedures and they could be hospitals, they could be dentist's office. They could be all, all, okay. all of them. Because, you know, we look at a lot of anonymized medical claims, so we know uh, where, where, where it comes from. We don't know who it is, but we know what, uh, that it happened. Now, where we are now, I guess the two things that I would say, one is retail and mail were not affected by by COVID at all. If anything, they benefited by, by COVID. What was affected the most was the non-retail part. And if you look at the non-retail part in 2020, you know, it went from a 7.5% increase to a 1.8% increase. Now, there's been some recovery since then. Now, the interesting, really interesting thing is when you get to this and you look at hospitals and hospitals had the biggest decline along with long-term care, which makes a lot of sense. Long-term care where the mortality was the highest, people were reluctant to put people in long-term care facilities, might have used more home health care. Uh, you see clinics recovered, but hospitals are actually a little weaker. And that actually, that is one product, which is the clery. You know, which was used extensively for, for COVID. It's down that pro one product down a half a billion dollars last year. And that's that's good news. Not not for not for Gilead, but it's good news because you know that uh, it means we don't have an epidemic that we have. So hospitals uh, uh, have have weakened because of one product. This is retail. Um, I would say that. In each of these, there's winners and losers. There's some people in mass merchandisers that are doing well, some aren't. Some in drug chains are doing well, some aren't. Same thing with food stores, some are, some aren't. But generally, who benefit the most is food stores. And for a presentation we're doing on, on Saturday, where they picked up the most was actually maintenance prescriptions. It's probably what happened was, is that if the food store was open, you needed to get your groceries, you move your prescriptions, to the food store so you can pick them up at the same time you picked up your groceries. Um, especially, you know, Peter talked a lot about, you know, uh, you know, biotech versus, I guess you could say biology versus small molecule. What we like to look at it as traditional versus special. And for the first time, specialty meds represent more than 50% of the market for the first time. It would have happened a couple of years ago, except COVID vaccines. COVID vaccines were traditional meds brands. So that's now, that's now up more than 50% and it's growing. And uh, you see the, the data line, which is the data line, which is traditional, there you go, is uh, starting to, uh, to weaken somewhat because th that traditional line was really influenced by the COVID vaccines. Now, if, if you look forward, and you look at this on a net basis, is that 55% of, uh, of the net spending is now specialty. And that's up 28% from 28% in 2011. And what the most interesting part of this chart is on the right-hand side. You start by the bottom is where we have traditional medicines. And it shows you that with the exception of diabetes, and I could make a case that maybe those diabetes products could be a specialty, Rather than traditional, because it's the uh, it's it's the shots, you know, it's a uh, it's a uh, Ozempic, it's Trulicity, you know, a lot of the ones you well, Rebelsis, you know, the rest of them are down because those classes have been genericized. I mean, think about 2012. We're talking about the biggest class was lipid regulators. You know, now generics have 97 percent share of lipid regulators, and in contrast that with the top right, which is um, Audioimmune oncology, you see total specialty, HIV, 
and MS weakening a bit because there, there were genericization on the Paxone and Tacvidera, and it looks like there's going to be a genericization on the Galeni that uh, I think Navarre has just lost their case on, on that. So very different, uh, very different uh, thing going on. Now, when you look at the classes, and this is from left to right to the five-year compounding and growth, and from bottom to top is the one-year growth. The bigger the ball, the bigger the class. If it's orange, it's a specialty class. If it's blue, it's a traditional class. And if it's underneath that 45 degree line, that means it's, uh, it's losing momentum on a dollar basis. If it's above the line, it means it has a lot of momentum. So what has a lot of momentum right now is pain. It's diabetes and it's uh, autoimmune as you would expect. Now, the two, three down below oncology. Why oncology? Probably the most likely reason there's three biosimilars and there's biosimilars and three in oncology. But might be have something to do with their less visits so people didn't get diagnosed with oncology, with, uh, with cancer. <laughs> um, bless you. HIV because of genericization, a uh, number of top products, multiple sclerosis, what I mentioned. And of course, the big one is autoimmune. Because come January 1st, there'll be a biosimilar out from Amgen to compete in Sumeru. First one, they get six months of exclusivity. And then next July, there might be six or seven jumping in at that time, one of which will be uh, a bioequivalent. So, you know, there are a couple of different scenarios of bioequivalent is going to work out, or is going to be bundling is going to work out. And then the other interesting thing was. Somebody wrote an article is when he expects people to make decisions on biosimilars, and some will make them right away, and some may not wait for we may wait for 2024. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens on it. Now, this is the one-year trend on specialty on the left-hand side, the five-year trend on the right-hand side. So you see immunology, oncology, HIV. All other, all other would include some of these cell and gene therapies and things of things of that sort. You notice that uh, um, viral hepatitis is uh, it is down, you know, almost ten billion dollars from where over the last five years. Now we were talking about that, you know, in 2017, the tsunami of hepatitis C medicine to cure. And uh, one thing about a cure is people don't come come back to get it, except rare exceptions. Because I was talking to a payer. Not too long ago, it says, uh, "Do I have to pay for the the cure for the fourth time?" Meaning that they cured somebody three times before, but they get that get reinfected by going back to their old habits. So that's a, I don't know how you answer that question, but you see, immunology, oncology, HIV are the are the are the are the big ones. Now these are the top uh, top ten categories: so immunology, diabetes, oncology, respiratory agents, antibiotics, HIV, mental health, pain multiple sclerosis and vaccines. And I make a copy of this available so you, know, you, you don't have to, you know, uh, to write everything down because I can talk faster than you can write. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, you know, the big three, uh, really very, very strong growth along with the any any coagulants. The next, uh, uh, you see H, uh, ADHD uh, growing. And this is, on a, this is on a dollar basis and you would think that it would be going the other direction since most of the ADHD drugs are generic now. And generally, you would see, you would expect it to go the, op the opposite way. And then uh, this is when you look at, especially you break it out, this is when you have to think about where is your product and is it going to be dispensed? Is it going to be dispensed in a retail pharmacy? Is it going to be dispensed in mail? Or is it going to be dispensed in, in the non retail marketplace? And so, retail is about 85% um, traditional, 15% specialty, is exact opposite in, in male. Uh, so where the anti, uh, the uh, autoimmune drugs, that's where the, the biggest change would be in male. And it's two thirds, uh, especially in non-retail, one third in, uh, in non-retail. Then the next thing you, you look at is, uh, we're gonna just concentrate on specialty products here. So this is the total market, and these are the top 10 specialty products, Humeric, Truda, Stellar, Embril, Victarvi, uh, Dupixin, Optivo, Ultravis, Pulse, Consentix, 
So you have a uh, few autoimmune number one and number three, uh, cancer number two, and uh, number not eight, uh, seven, multiple source number eight. Uh, most of the other ones, uh, Victarvi number five is HIV. Most of the other ones are autoimmune. And right behind, uh, if you mirror it, Stellar will lose probably big classes of competition in 2024. So this is, uh, if you think about uh, you have 29 billion, you have $40 billion worth of product that's going to be biosimilar in the next couple of years, which is going to be quite interesting. Uh, this is the, the different categories of retail mail and non-retail. So retail is top three, HIV, immunology, oncology, uh, mail, immunology, oncology, multiple sclerosis, and uh, a little bit different in non-retail oncology, immunology, and multiple sclerosis. So it all depends on your product, what the class is, what the specialty is, and where it's going to be dispensed. So looking at the non-retail market, you know, cancer number one, Cancer number two, number three, multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, is the product that, that I was, was, was talking about. And uh, um, Victarvi, Remicade, Remicade uh, it was a bit of bio uh, not too long ago. You know, Humira, number nine, Decentix, number 10. And so this is non retail. This is male, Humira, Stellar, Emerald, uh, Dufixin, and so forth. Skyrizi, you know, a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, autoimmune in Rubica is actually a cancer drug with more small molecule. You know, it depends again, is it small molecule or not? And then the retail, you know, Victarvi, Humira, Discovi, Gamoya. So one, two, three, and four and five are all uh, HIV, uh, two, six, um, and eight uh, are all uh, are autoimmune. And Vegas Sassana is, uh, is, I think, is bipolar disease. Then I want to talk about, you, you know, Peter alluded to, uh, you know, the unpopularity of the, of, of the pharmaceutical industry. And I believe is that the pharmaceutical industry gets a bad rap. Now, the perception that they have in Washington, the perception they have in state governments, when they mostly look at list prices, uh, is that the pharmaceutical pricing is out of, out of, out of control. And we, we looked at this on a net price basis and we looked at a five-year period from 2016 to 2021 and the market increased $82 billion. So why, what increased the most? What increased the most was existing volume on existing products. That increased $94 billion. Next was new brands, new innovation, that was 87.7. Now, a lot of this was offset and then we somehow we missed the value, but you can see the size of the line is about 97 odd billion dollars offset by loss of, loss of exclusivity. Meaning products have lost their patents, they're much cheaper, it creates financial headroom to pay for the, for the more expensive, especially drugs. And then, then the third column over is, uh, is the protected brand net price. Which is actually negative. And if you wanted to kind of fast forward, well, I'll, I'll go this way and come back. This was only updated through 2021. Now you can imagine what the inflation rate that we have at 90 some odd percent in the third quarter of 2022 is that uh, brand, brand pharma price increases are even a greater divide between that and, and the CPI. And the we thought that what, what was very important to do is look at what net drug spending was in a variety of different countries, net drug spending. And in these uh, 10 or 12 countries, this pharmaceuticals was 15% of the spending, of the net spending. The US that number is 14%. So con you know, contrary to what all everybody thinks, it's not, it's not the case. Now, what's inflated? Tell me, name me the thing that's inflated the most over the last 20 years. Hospital care. That's where the problem is. Hospital care. And that's inflated 200%. Anybody have an idea what's second? College tuition. <laughs> Third, college textbooks. Fourth, the only index of 120 is the rest of health care. Nobody wants to touch the hospital care because it's a larger employee, employer, 
in every congressional district. But that's that's basically where the where the problem is. And the other thing I'll say on this is that you have all these rebates that go back to the plan sponsors. That's what we look at between gross and net. And the plan sponsors every day would rather have a thousand dollar product with a five hundred dollar rebate than a two hundred dollar product with no rebate. What do they do with that money? They largely offset healthcare premiums. So you could say that a lot of what's spent on pharmaceuticals and all the rebates is offsetting healthcare expenditures or healthcare premiums for employees. So I think there should be more credit to it than, than it is. Um, patients adherence is that we know the older you get, the more prescriptions you have, and we see the number of prescriptions uh, you know, starting to increase. And you know, and and I did studies is that of that 750 million people, the average number of prescriptions per person was six. So you can multiply 750,000 by six and figure out how many prescriptions don't exist in the in the marketplace for that given year. And you think about the year after that, the year after that, and so forth. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of conversation on health equity, a lot of conversation on uh, ES, ESG. Um, sometimes, you know, I was in Europe last week at a wholesaler conference, and uh, some of these wholesalers in some of these countries deliver eight times a day. So they're talking about, let's do electric cars. I said, you're going to save a lot more money and you'd be better for environment to deliver once a day or twice a day. But we kind of, it's kind of crazy. But the more risk factors you have, the more likely you're not going to be you're not going to be compliant. And these are these risk factors that, that we see. Uh, and the highest ones are what we call food security and income and housing. That so food security and income is unemployment, occupation income, your housing, your built occupied units, renters, and so forth. Those those are the highest. And uh, as you can understand, with uh, with people coming across the border and the homeless, this is this situation is getting worse. We actually saw the the medical adherence go down in the class of, of diabetes. So it's one is you know with the Med, Medicare Part B is is they're measured on, on adherence is you only can lead people to water doesn't mean you can get them to drink because the stats that we see is about one quarter of the people that get a prescription never get it filled. So, you know, we see people that are here going to go non adherent and vice versa, but 25% will never be adherent. Opioids, there's a little conversation about that. And I think uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Marks talked about it. But when we talk about overdose deaths, we're talking about fentanyl and methamphetamine. And I, and my, my guy that works for me, lives in Michigan, said in the Governmental debate in Michigan, they were thinking that uh, fentanyl is a prescription drug. Get that? It's not a it, it, there's fentanyl patch is a prescription drug, but what we're seeing is coming from China over the Mexican border. That's fentanyl, and you see that there was a big rise in overdose deaths, and prescription drugs only contributed 12.4 percent of those. So that meant 88 percent of those with something other. And sometimes it's a kind of a combination. And uh, you see the, the, big, uh, the big ones uh, were fentanyl, huge increase uh, uh, from pre-COVID to post-COVID. Same thing with methamphetamine, same thing with cocaine. The thing is something what you're seeing now is a lot of get, people get these things from social media and they think they're getting Percocet and what they get is fentanyl and they die from it. And now they actually are marketing fentanyl in uh, color-coded tablets. And you know, that, and I see all these states have their programs and prescription drugs. I've yet to see a program in the state on fentanyl. And that's what's killing people right now. And people don't understand it. They think it's a prescription drug. This is a prescription drug opioids. They went up, they went up, now they're going down. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the peak of the over over the peak of the uh, prescribing of opioids prescription opioids was 2011, and we are down to levels that were 
50% of what they were then and back to the level of where we were in the year 2000. You see that every prescriber, and that's why I'll get, you will get the copy that you can actually read that because uh, somehow this got lost in translation, is that uh, almost every, well, every uh, specialty has reduced the prescribing of opioids. And I'm sorry that he left uh, on the non-addictive opioid uh, thing, which is very, very interesting to see this chart. And the one that, that has changed their behavior the most is dentists. Think about before, it would be normal if you get a tooth extraction, that you get a 10-day supply, and now you're lucky to get three. And the one that's kind of the highest is nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants. There are more of those. Think about minute clinics, health hubs. Think about Village MD with Walgreens. There's more people frontlining in uh, these clinics as it's a good alternative for people going to uh, uh, to doctor's office and so forth. And the other thing, as I've said before, you may have heard it, is most people that overdosed on a prescription drug did not have a prescription for the first place. Is they, they got it from a friend, they took it from a friend, they bought it off the street, and so forth. You know, and you see that uh, 40, you know, 42 percent got it from doctors, and that doesn't mean that, you know, that they actually use that. So, interesting enough. Next, we'll look at generic and biosimilars. And as Peter alluded to, is the problem on generics is not volume. The problem on uh, generics is value. And uh, I call it. Uh, some days I call it the perfect storm. Some day I call it the race to the bottom. Now, what's the perfect storm? You have three generic purchasers in the United States to fill 91% of the purchases. You have an FDA that's very prolific in proving new, what we call ANDAs. And oftentimes, they might approve as many as 20 of them for a, a particular model. With three buyers, there might be room for maybe six, six players in that market. Not 10, not 20. And then you have uh, 40 new generic players in the United States, 400 more generic players worldwide in the last five years. And some of them just want to get a little piece of the action uh, in the marketplace and don't care about the bottom line. But that stresses out the people that care about the bottom line. And an example I had was talking to somebody that he had a bid for 88 cents a, a vial on something and somebody bid 35 cents. And uh, he was wondering whether they should match the, uh, match the bid or not. Determined that it cost them 35 cents just for the, the vial and the cotton. That, that wasn't the shipping or the, the pills or the, all, the, all the rest of the stuff. So it's a real mess. And uh, you see that uh, uh, 87, 88% uh, of the prescriptions are uh, filled by unbranded prescriptions. And that number is uh, uh, the dollar value is uh, 8.9. So think about not almost 90% of the prescriptions filled are unbranded generics, and they only count for 9% of the value. And I would suggest that they should count for more. There was some thought, and this is the price deflation, is that uh, generally it is in the 3-5% range. There was some thought from my friend Eric Hirsch from Nephron that inflation would, would uh, uh, which you saw in August, would play a role that it went right back down uh, and the, the price uh, inflation went right back down in, uh, in September. But sooner or later, push has got to come, come to shove because the cost of everything is going up. The cost of labor is up, the cost of energy is up, the cost of shipping is going up. So sooner or later, don't know when, is that it's, it's got to it's happen. And then, um, and the other thing I want to say on that race at the bottom, all those ANDAs that get approved, Used to be five years ago, 66 percent of launch. They actually commercialized in the marketplace. That number is 20 percent now. That means 80 percent of the ones that got approved don't launch. What a colossal waste of money that is. But you know, sometimes you don't know whether you're going to be the first one or the 20th one. But you know, sometimes I would suggest this of my generic friends. You know, you got to know when to hold them, when to hold. Them. If it looks like you're going to be number 10 or 20. You know, there's no sense uh, pursuing it. So most of going forward is we've been in this big uh, period of time of uh, patent losses on small molecules. 
and the patent losses going forward are largely going to be more on biologics than they are on small molecules. And we say that we think about $104 billion worth uh, of opportunity uh, in the next uh, in the next four years. And so you see what the what the cone the cone is, you know, what the high and what the low would be. Now, to give you an example, is I mentioned those free oncology biosimilars. So that's a vastin, rituxin, receptin. So the biosimilars have 73% of the avastin molecule. They have 53% of the rituxin molecule, and they have uh, about 69% of the receptin molecule. So really happened really, really fast. The next one in support of care, first one is Nupagen. Uh, that's 72%. Uh, the next one is, is Dulasta. That's a lot lower. And then you have Remicade uh, uh, starting to finally grow. Um, we thought that, Medic, uh, that Remicade would, would convert much faster, but there was big bundling going on in that. And then Bios, the, what makes Dulasta a little bit difficult because you have Dulasta on pro, it kind of, you, instead of going back to the doctor, get an injection or back to the hospital, they stick something on that injects you over the next uh, next 48 hours. That loses patents later on. Now, product launches. So, and maybe there's a correlation with uh, what some of the things Peter was saying versus what we're starting to see, is that uh, there's been 39 launches this year, and last year there was 57 during this time frame. Now, a caveat being in 21, 20, in 19, we saw a similar number of products launch, 69, 70, 71 in that, in that range. And this year, 39. So it's doubtful that we're going to be back to the range that we saw before. 18% uh, of the launches in oncology, 18% infectious disease, 18% in dermatology. And that oncology number is kind of historically low, generally it's much, much higher. Infectious disease and COVID vaccines and the you know, in the, you know, some of the monoclonal antibodies and so forth. The biggest one is uh, is a diabetes product from Lilly. Second biggest one is wet uh, macro generation. And you can see what the third what the third one is. Now the issue that, so this is the launches. And you can see historically, you know, oncology used to be 31% of the launches. Now it's the 18%. So that's changed. Now, what the marketplace is really looking for uh, and anticipating there may be two potential launches in Elton that can happen in the next 18 months or so. And if there's a if there's a disease state that we need uh, more effective products in, it's Alzheimer's and dementia. And if we thought that Hep C was big, this would be much bigger because the patient population with Alzheimer's and dementia is much bigger than it was for hepatitis hepatitis C. Uh, the concern, so th these are the top, uh, the top of 2022, 21, the top one was Wacovi, which was a weight loss drug, a variation of Nova Nordis diabetes drug. Uh, and uh, the potential on that is, might be so big that uh, it may put gastric bypasses out of business because your experiences, you could possibly lose as much as 16% of your body. And uh, um, so we'll see that. And then 2020 with Vic, Vic Thurry, uh was, was a big one. But if you look at these, you know, these are fairly small. They're, you know, well, Kobe can be a blockbuster. Uh, the Curry was a blockbuster. Maybe the diabetes product would be a blockbuster. But right now, I'm not seeing other ones. The, the launches that we're saying, the, the trajectories are, are less than they've been before. Um, and uh, the uh, you know the difficulty there is to get the patient acquisition. That is the big challenge right now. And then uh, how do you engage and get the healthcare practitioners engaged, which was much more difficult during COVID because they were locked down. And the ones that were like lending themselves to digital, like migraine drugs, did better than the ones that needed a lot of titration to multiple visits to doctors. And uh, you know, then there's an issue of uh, how do you get to, how do you get paid for these things? These are the margin pressures. You notice that a lot of margin pressures in diabetes and a lot of margin pressures in immunology. 
Uh, so where the rebating is almost 80% in diabetes, it's uh, it's more than 50% immunology, not a lot of rebating in oncology yet. And maybe we'll never, never see it. So uh, I think one of the messages I want to give is the, this market is much more complex than it's been ever before. It is There's declining efficiency. There's more efforts for lower returns. The growing spend, spend is growing faster than revenue. Uh, future best price implications, indirect program costs set to skyrocket. Health equity gaps, patients who need access do not have it. And a real challenge for pharma. Um, abandonment is uh, is big, and uh, this looks at different price points of abandonment. And you see that abandonment is up everywhere, depending. It doesn't matter what price point you're talking about, but it's particularly acute uh, uh, when you get to hundred dollars, particularly when you get over two hundred fifty dollars. So, you know, it's a it's a balancing act. You want to get these people on the medicines, but you want to keep them on on the medicines. And they're more they're more expensive. Here's a when I talk about the patient journey. Here, here's a, here's an example of that. So immunology, new to brand patient experience, is if you're new to brand on, on in immunology, in 97 percent of the time you'll have an initial re rejection, and only uh, three percent of the time when you get first day put on. And then uh, you see the payer controls are strong. And then when you look at immunology due to brand patient experience, is that 68% is a, is a durable rejection. Now, what I hope it is, is generally if in immunology, they start you out with the cheapest one, then they would move you another one, move you another one after that, and you would finally get on the one that you're meant to be on in the first place. And somebody just came out with a blood test that will say, which one should you be on? Because I would think that It'd be much cheaper to get on that product, the right product the first time and stay on that product and cheaper in the, cheaper in the long run. That might mean that there might be some different mindsets that have to take place. The other one is a blood test now for three different, uh, 30 different cancers. So we're really starting to, and that stuff is really, really interesting. Um, and then it's probably what Discussion, the first discussion was uh, cell and gene therapies, but uh, high cost treatments have accelerated. And that's why we need the generic expirations. That's why we need biosimilars to pay for high cost uh, innovation. So these are, it lists the number of products that were, were more than $200 a year, $200,000 a year. And you look at uh, every year that was more and more, and the average for the last uh, four years has been 400 and some odd thousand dollars. And I wouldn't be surprised if we look at the next six years, it might be 600,000 or something like that. So this is going to be the challenge. The good news is many of these for smaller patient populations and not the broad patient populations, but uh, you know, the affordability can be a big issue there would be big massive bills for small patient populations and the quandary is how to, how to pay for it. And the launches we've seen, you know, COVID, 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 COVID vaccines, COVID, uh, um, and COVID therapeutics, which is very good. And then, so when we talk innovation, is that we talk, our, you know, probably beat to death specialty, but we also talk about orphan drugs. Uh, um, the two doctors were talking about cell and gene therapies and then the monoclonal antibodies, you know, so innovation is very different than it was before. Now, Peter, you were speculating about the clinical trials, and this is our this is late state pipeline. And uh, you see that uh, maybe there was a flattening during COVID, uh, but you saw rapid acceleration in their 68% uh, late stage pipeline expansion since 2000, uh, 2016. Now, any guess of where it is? To your answer? Oncology. Oncology is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Followed by GI products. GI products is uh, is really you know Crohn's disease things of things of that sort. Neurology, you know the Alzheimer's uh, infectious disease, immunology, allergy, um, eye and ear vaccines. So we're down the home stretch. Uh, outlook. I know this is an eye chart, and 
I only could read part of it because I have dry macro degeneration. So I'm praying for you to come up with a dry macro degeneration drug. There's wet ones out there, but uh, I have to be, have to be dry. Uh, so, you know, we expect the market to return to pre pandemic levels in 2023. We're pretty much pretty much there, although the discussion is. Right. Is it are we back to normal or is there a new normal? I say it's probably some sort of new normal. Um, there's gonna be a bigger gap between invoice price spending and net price spending. That's why I got to educate a little bit of people about net. Uh, the loss of exclusivity is gonna be big again, mostly on the biological side. Immunology, oncology, and neurology drive the growth. Caveat on immunology with the Solara and uh, um, Umera. Uh, diabetes spending is going to be under stress, you know, because of the 80% rebating. Um, and uh, uh, autoimmune uh, uh, will be an interesting marketplace because the volume should go up, the value should come down. And then we knew it, we do have a new uh, definition, which you probably in this new gener uh, generation bio uh, biotherapeutics. For our other term for the companies is emerging biotech companies. You know, so in, this is where a lot of you are down in that space, and uh, we expect that to that to grow. To give you some examples, this is what the what the market forecast looked like. So back to pre-pandemic levels. This is what uh, the classes we expect to grow the most uh, through 2026. So you see that uh, you can't you have to trust me. <laughs> But uh, oncology, um, you see uh, uh, autoimmune, uh, diabetes, and so forth. So we'll make sure we get you, give me your cards, and I'll make sure you get a copy of this. Uh, this is the autoimmune, so the, the value is going to go down or the volume is going to go up. Because hypothetically, the cheaper something is, the more people can afford it, the more people can stay on it. And then, you know, the, this market is very complex, and it's, it's compounding and accelerating. So you have Alzheimer's. So hopefully we'll have some help there soon. Rare and orphan cures, we talked about that this morning. Patient experience, challenge when you look at the, the edits and the pre-authorization and so forth. Biosimilars, uh, consolidation, though uh, I think the, the one thing to watch on, on consolidation will be FTC allow Kroger and Albertsons to merge. I guess uh, seven centers say they don't want to merge it. And I say it all comes down to how do you define the market? If you define it just as supermarkets, then they probably won't win. But if you put Walmart in there, which I think is the largest grocery chain in, in the country, Sam Clubs does a, a bunch, BJ's does a bunch, uh, and some of these others, you know, depends on how they define the market. Public policy reform, 340B reform, uh, reform or growth. Um, uh, uh, AAPs and best price, uh, um, payer control, launch suppression, um, margin depression, and COVID, with hopefully COVID being in the back and the rear view mirror. So we do have uh, um, a site that you can go and you can pull down a lot of reports. And uh, we do, our, our, our QB Institute publishes a lot of reports, R&D reports, biosimilar reports, uh, Global Use of Medicines reports, U.S. Use of Medicines reports, uh, um, oncology reports. So very interesting to see the trends on that. So we have market insight, patient-centric health, engagement innovation. So I ask you to go there, and if I could have your cards, I'll send you the presentation. And uh, I, I had an amateur move today or yesterday. Left my business card at home. Never do that. So uh, if you give me your business cards, that will allow me to be able to reach out to you, and I'd be happy to help you. Any way that possible. So, with that kind of attention, I thank you for your kind of attention. We have to answer any questions. Yes, yeah, please. I have a question. And oh, by the way, anyone who wants to ask questions in person here, just raise your hand. And then anyone who's online, if you want to just raise your use a raise hand function. Uh, Doug, you know, you and I over dinner, we were chatting a little bit about the geopolitical situation. Um, you know, in your speech here, didn't focus on the current problem with China and so forth. But I know you had some interesting thoughts about what you thought the impact of this tension between China, you know, the India situation in the US. Any thoughts on what you think is going to evolve and what impact will have on the pharma industry? 
Well, I think that at the very least, you need to know where all these products come from. You need to know where the key starter materials come from. You need to know where the API comes from. You need to know where the needles come from. You know where the vials come from. You need to know where that where that where that comes from. So as much as you can diversify that, the better off you are. You don't want to rely on any one player and be be captive to that. And that this could stand for any country around around the world. Next thing we know, labor costs are going to go up, shipping costs are going to go up, so it's going to be more expensive to get from point to point A to point B. The next thing is that you hope the governments have stockpiling programs that uh, stockpile the appropriate products because we want to make sure when the next thing comes around the horizon that we have those products that we need. And hopefully we've learned from this and know what to have and not, not what to have and when you need to have them. Uh, because, you know, getting ventilators early in the epidemic was very difficult. When they were thrown away at the end of the epidemic, just too many. Uh, so you need to do, need to do some do, need to do some stockpiling. You know, there was a big push on let's do local manufacturing. Um, I, I think the, these pharmaceutical plants are not in the cleanest place. You know, not the most environmentally friendly places in the world. Uh, and nobody wants them in their backyard, and they're very expensive to build in the United States. So I'm not sure that part's that part's going to happen. But you need to know where this, you know, you need to know your supply chain, you know, where the ingredients are, where the vials are, where the fill, fills are, key starting materials. You know. Questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Yes. And just uh, say your name and the mic will pick you up. Yes, my name is Ida, and thank you for the presentation. I have noticed there's not many or enough innovation in the cardiovascular area. Despite the fact that it is the leading cause of death significantly, and why do you think it causes in your opinion? I think maybe it might be that they, unlike you, they don't see that there's room for further innovation in the class. Although, you know, my concern is, is that do we, is there a better way to do lift regulate, you know, cardiovascular lift regulator things? Is there a new way to? To do those because they are the things that, that kill the most no, most people, and uh, the perception is that uh, there, there are better opportunities in other places like oncology, neurology, and uh, you know, and uh, now probably the GI. Yeah, there's quite a bit research. Launch number so. I'm confused. So was it 23 to 26 summer of data group in 2022 have evidence in launch or is it 39 launches? I saw two different slides, I'm not sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to get out of here and read it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the slide number? Uh, Just keep going. Okay. Going. Getting close. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right there. So 23 of the 26 FDA approved enemies show evidence of launch. But then in the next, oh, wait, there on the left hand side, it says 39 for launch. Oh, so the other launches were uh, approved in 2021. Correct. Okay. And why, where are the other three do you think? Why haven't they launched? Probably because they uh, either that they don't think they can make a commercial return or they might require so much titration with small ability to die, which is not feasible. Okay. So if you want to follow up, yeah. we'll talk to you later. Okay. Any questions from our virtual attendees at all? Let's see. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see. Do you think that the advances in specialty drug is due to mainly limitations of traditional drugs or other reasons? So I, I mean, especially drugs, that's where the innovation has been to the point we just talked about. There hasn't been a lot of innovation on cardiovascular, there hasn't been a lot of innovation with the regulators at this time, and, uh, and also the anti-hypertensives. 
My question was, there's a slide with the oncology showing the, the huge spike. Uh, I was curious if that was a spike in number of trials or is that just the number of contacts? Trial. It was a trial, so the, okay, that, that's a reasonable part of my question. And hypothetically, they didn't. Yeah, but I mean, if you have, you know, most like, like some of the, you know, if you're the um, doing. Right. It was a thousand of the trials. Yeah. You know, that explains a lot of it. Yeah. Will you pause now? It's okay. <laughs> um, I want to, so you can understand why Deb is saying that. Why that is. It's amazing. I usually end up with a headache at the end because so much information <laughs> has been, has been, I don't uh, think I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. So, but uh, thank you so much, Deb. That was very, very helpful. And, I really focused on a lot of the more recent trends that we need to hear about, right, in the industry. 